The strongest pre-meds follow a blueprint. The weakest, they hope that they accidentally get into medical school. I'm Mike. I've helped thousands of pre-meds get into their dream medical schools. And today, I'll hand you the pre-med formula. The exact five milestones top pre-meds complete by their sophomore year. At the end, I'll show you an exact pre-med roadmap that you can follow so you know you're not behind. Phase one prioritize. One year ago, you started college. And if you're not taking a gap year in one and a half years, you're going to apply to medical school. You're nearly halfway there. And if you haven't accomplished very much, it's time now to surgically prioritize. There are only six levers that adcoms care about. GPA, MCAT, extracurriculars, letters of recommendation, your written application, and your school list. Your school list and your written application right now are irrelevant, so ignore them and make room for the rest. And at this stage in your journey, here is the order of importance. GPA, extracurriculars, MCAT, letters of recommendation. Now, if you're lost and have no idea what competitive looks like, take a look at our eight full AMCAS applications in our application database. We've shared it to over 11,400 pre-meds. To see it, click the application database link in our description box below. Now, phase two, GPA. We have two milestones. One, take the right classes to prepare for the MCAT. That means that any class that does not fall into this list is considered low priority. Remove them. Gen Chem 1, Gen Chem 2, O Chem 1, O Chem 2, Physics 1, Physics 2, Physics 3, Bio 1, Bio 2, Bio 3, and Bio Chem 1. That's it. Nope. You don't need Gen Chem Lab or O Chem Lab for the MCA. Push these classes back, even if everyone takes lab with Gen Chem 2. Nope. Spanish or calculus are not on the MCAT push them back. You don't need a GE. You don't need a writing course. You don't need a psych social class. Finish the high priority MCAT prerequisites before the end of sophomore year. Then, and only then, if you have extra units, go ahead and add the rest of the low priority classes. But above all else, finish the prereqs first. Milestone number two, maintain a 3.8 GPA. This will get you past most, if not all, medical schools' number screening. Higher is certainly better and will give you buffer during your junior and senior years to worry less about your grades and spend more time doing other things to improve your candidacy. The number one mistake pre-meds make at this stage is on either end of the spectrum. On one extreme, pre-meds don't balance their course loads and they take far too many classes and it hurts their GPA. On the other end of the spectrum, we take too few units because we're worried about our GPA and now we haven't moved meaningfully along our pre-med journey. Above all else, balance your course load and protect your GPA at all costs. If you need to take a gap year to ensure that GPA is pristine, that is a smart decision. A hit to your GPA at this stage kills your chances substantially. And it's this attention to detail that separates pre-meds who become doctors from those who do not. And if you're applying to medical school in the next year or two, you do not want to make the wrong decisions. We work with four students per month. After that, we're full. And if you only want to apply to medical school, school one time, click the application cycle advising link below to book a free strategy call before we are packed for the cycle. Phase three, extracurriculars. There are four buckets, clinical experience, research, shadowing, and community service. For each, I'll give you the sophomore milestone and the number one mistake to avoid. Clinical experience, milestone, 300 hours by the end of sophomore year. More importantly, a clear focus on thematic fit. For example, our student, Ga Linda, started an accessibility program at her local museum that helps neurodivergent populations better experience the art. She also earns her clinical hours by supporting families with autistic children through behavioral play therapy and helps coordinate their visits with occupational therapy and other medical providers. It's clear that there's this memorable theme of neurodivergent populations. The number one mistake, 2,000 hours of EMT will not trump 300 hours of clear thematically aligned clinical experiences. Here is where working smart can substantially improve your chances to get into med school. 2,000 hours of being a scribe or an EMT won't get you in. 
by the 1000th hour, you certainly won't be making any new larger impact in that role. And often scribing and EMTs are one size fit all clinical experiences. It is absolutely worth spending extra time upfront to find the right clinical experience. Even if ultimately you only spend 300 as opposed to 2000 hours, spending even 100 hours to find that perfect fit makes it more memorable, makes it clear that you have a reason why you're choosing this extracurricular over others. Do not ignore this. Outside of poor stats, the number one reason that pre-meds get rejected is that they have a cookie cutter generic application that is not memorable. Vanessa, one of our students who earned a full ride scholarship to Kaiser and just got into UCSF, she focused her time on supporting underserved Latinx communities. Now, if you feel like or know you're not competitive, we can help. Click the application cycle advising link in the description box below now. Milestone, 50 hours in three different contexts. Spend time in an operating room, in an outpatient center, in a dialysis center, in a hospital, in a chemotherapy infusion center outside of the hospital. Medicine is practiced everywhere. Mistake, don't overdo it. You don't need 300 hours of passive shadowing. Research, milestone, 300 hours. Aim for about 10 plus hours a week. And more than hours, aim for continuity, independence, and ownership over your project. Ask your mentors what skills you need to develop to take that next leap on your project. Mistake, the first lab you join may not be the best lab for you. Sometimes labs don't have the best infrastructure for mentorship. And other times, you just don't really care about what you're studying. So take the time to find the right place. And yes, that means leaving a lab that you work so hard to get into. A supportive lab is everything. And the sooner you find that lab, the more those hours can compound and do something for your application. Community service, milestone 200 hours. Again, theme here is everything. Paint a picture that makes sense between all of your extracurriculars. And a big goal here is to accomplish something larger than yourself through a team. Mistake. Your soup kitchen community service experience here will hurt you twice. One, because it's not aligned at all. And two, because those 500 hours you spent are taking away from a different extracurricular that could have made you more competitive. It's those decisions that kill your candidacy. Remember, average pre-meds do average things and get average results. And on average, 60% of pre-meds don't get in anywhere. You'll have to do unique things to get unique results. To be clear, these hours are estimates. Most important is your impact and responsibilities within these extracurriculars. If you have impact, you can get away with a lot. The most dangerous mistake that sophomores make with their extracurriculars is that they coast during this year. The hours rack up and 100 becomes 300. But you have the same exact volunteer or scribe role and your impact has not changed throughout the entire year year. You must remember that you do need time and space to do great work. So drop the activities that don't help you with that. And you know what activities those are. The one hour on Tuesday at 7 p.m. to sit in an empty lecture hall to hear about a Panda Express fundraiser, that's not helping you. Give me my hour back and use it differently. Goal. Establish a clear identity and direction for your application. You can always change this later, but it is time to commit to your best guess of what your theme will be, what matters to you and what is true to you now. Ensure that the extracurriculars you choose make it clear what matters to you. And if you feel lost, start with the accepted applications on the application database. Again, a link in the description box below. Phase four, the MCAT. If you're taking no gap year, take the MCAT in the summer between your sophomore and junior years. Again, make sure you finish the prereqs in phase two so that you're optimally prepared. Maybe I don't have to tell you this, but you only want to take this exam once. In February, set an alarm to check the AAMC website and MCAT Twitter for registration dates. Pre-commit to a date, sign up, 
and then open up time in the summer to study for it. I recommend about 40 hours a week, like a full-time job. That means saying no to a full-time research position. At most, I took six hours a week of Spanish three and coached two hours a week of youth basketball on Saturdays. That's it. If you can afford to, no other commitments and protect the time you need. Goal, sign up for the MCAT, then forget about it until the summer comes. Mistake. If you don't want to spend 15 seconds signing up for it, you'll be like the other thousands of pre-meds come August who complain that they have to take their test in Alaska. I'm telling you now, you know when it opens. They tell you six months in advance, so please pre-commit and sign up. Phase five, letters of recommendation. If you go to a large public school like UCLA, your sophomore year classes will likely have 300 plus students in it. If you're really enjoying one particular class, engage more through office hours. An email every three weeks about something interesting and relevant goes a long way. For example, one of our students sent an email to his Buddhist professor about a video game titled Ghosts of Tsushima. This is about the first Mongol invasion in Japan and the professor brought it up to the entire class. It was a cool moment moment for the both of them. More often, your impactful letters will come not from your classes. They'll come from your extracurriculars, your research, your community service, the projects you do with professors outside of class. So this comes secondary to the good work that you do in phase three. Goal, build a list of potential letter writers. Focus mostly on doing the important work that generates real impact. From beginning to end, here is a sophomore who is on track to get into some of the best medical schools in the country. Let's take a look now at a real student who has surpassed all of the sophomore milestones. She has a 3.92 GPA, and this is her four-year plan. You'll notice that in green are all the prerequisites for the MCAT, the gen chems, the o chems, the physics, the bios, and the biochems. There are labs thrown in here, but they're not necessary. There is math thrown in here. There are GEs thrown in here, but they're not necessary. Above all else, these courses, these six plus six, these 12 courses must be completed prior to the summer so that you are fully optimized for the MCAT. And speaking of the MCAT, we are scheduling the MCAT. If we are going to take it that summer, it looks like dates for 2025 will open on Wednesday, February 19th. So we take a look at our handy phone, set an alarm or reminder for Wednesday, February 19th at noon Eastern time and sign up for a date before school starts. I would recommend one or two weeks before just so that you have some vacation after you destroy the exam. Moving past the MCAT milestone, we look at extracurriculars and you can see here an astounding level of thematic alignment. We start from the top with her HIV AIDS lab where she has spent 4,000 hours, is a co-first author in a publication and is in the departmental honors program working on some seriously independent, awesome work. Now we go to her clinical volunteering where she is the lead street medicine outreach person and her outreach efforts have tested 145 unhoused individuals for HIV, thematic alignment with her basic research project. She has secured 300 doses of naloxone and 400 fentanyl test strips and has interviewed 125 individuals about the barriers surrounding healthcare access that happen for people who live on the streets. Furthering this infectious disease angle, she's a clinical research assistant where she studies Vietnam veterans and their risk of developing cirrhosis after hepatitis C infection, where here she also collaborates with clinicians in Kenya, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. And you'll see even her shadowing is thematically aligned. She spent 75 hours in Bolivia learning about more infectious diseases different places all tied together with this string of infectious disease and of course not everything in her life has to be infectious disease related one of her biggest hobbies is performing ballet and she works as the principal dancer choreographer and social chair for the club ballet company lastly we move on to her letters of recommendation and we can see they're stratified by two science one non-science and then the rest of them 
Not all medical schools will have this strict two signs, one non-science requirement, but it's good to have them in case they do require that. And you can see she has a variety of possible letters of recommendation already from her HIV lab, from her 16 person small person research seminar, from her Greek critical reading writing course, the president of the street medicine clinic, the infectious disease doctor that helped her with the IRB and the interviewing of 125 individuals on the street about healthcare barriers, and then a research mentor in a separate lab. You'll notice that probably the strongest letters will come from extracurriculars. That one's from her research, 4,000 hours. That one's from her street medicine clinic, 1,500 hours. That one's from her uh, other research, three to 500 hours. And these two that are from courses, they should be good, but they likely will not be the strongest. So don't stress so much if you go to a public school with a ton of students because the most strong letters will come from your extracurriculars. This is what it looks like to be a superstar sophomore pre-med who has surpassed all the milestones and will be competitive for any medical school she applies to. And yes, in case you're wondering, she is real. That is Abby, one of our pre-meds applying in the coming years. Now that you know what to do, you'll need to know why adcoms deeply care about each of those aspects. In this video, I share what med school adcoms can't stand, but won't always tell you. Goodbye.